75 year old male presents after a mechanical fall down a flight of stairs, striking his head. He was GCS 15 after the fall and had no vital sign of abnormalities with EMS. His past medical history is significant only for hypertension and hyperlipidemia, for which he takes medication, but he's not on any blood thinners. In the ED, he arrives and sees spine precautions. The primary trauma survey is unremarkable and his vitals are normal with a negative FAST exam. His neurologic examination reveals weakness in the bilateral upper extremities. Specifically, his shoulder shrug was normal bilaterally, but his elbow flexors were 4 out of 5, and his wrist and elbow extensors were 3 out of 5, as were his finger flexors. His lower extremities, however, are normal in motor and sensory examination. He had normal rectal tone, and his bulbocavernosis reflex was present. As mentioned, his sensory examination was normal, including in the saddle region. His reflexes were 1 plus in the upper extremities bilaterally and normal in the lower. He underwent a CT and a CTA that revealed underlying degenerative disc disease and a small amount of canal narrowing, while the CT carotids did not demonstrate any vascular abnormalities. The remainder of his PAN scan, which he underwent due to the fall down the flight of stairs, was negative. So the main finding is bilateral weakness in the distal upper extremities more than the proximal muscles without other neurologic deficits. So what's going on here in the context of trauma? Well, a hyperextension injury in a patient with underlying degenerative cervical spine disease with upper extremity weakness greater than lower extremity weakness really likely indicates central cord syndrome. There is a differential diagnosis that does include ischemia, and that could be brain or spinal cord, brachial plexus injury, though it would be a little bit unusual to be bilateral, or some traumatic peripheral neuropathy, among others. But this presentation really does fit with central cord syndrome. So let's go through a few key questions related to this incomplete spinal cord injury. First, what is central cord syndrome? Well, bear with me for what I promise is a very short anatomy of discussion. Historically, it was thought that hyperextension caused anterior compression of the spinal cord by either bony spurs or a disc, and this is still likely true. But it used to be thought that it resulted in hemorrhaging in the spinal cord, which has not seemed to be the case. And it was thought to ultimately disrupt the cortical spinal tracts that control the hand and upper limb, which are medially placed, and not really affecting the cortical spinal tracts of the leg, hence the central cord syndrome. But more recent studies have found that it's not that simple, as upper extremity fibers located centrally and lower extremity fibers more laterally. Rather, it's now thought that the hand and upper limb nerve fibers are just more densely contained within the lateral cortical spinal tract, which happens to be preferentially injured in these circumstances. So it's a bit of a misnomer to call it a central cord syndrome now that we understand a little bit more of the pathophysiology. Also worth noting that it really is a heterogeneous disease, despite some commonalities in the clinical presentation. And there are several distinct injury patterns and each has various treatment options, so let's start with them. The first, the most common, is a cervical hyperextension injury without any injury on CT, or rarely any injury on CT, and there's often pre-existing central canal stenosis. This is the prototypical patient that we think of, and the one that I presented in the case at the start. It's important to note that their neurologic findings are often greater than the mechanism. It might seem surprising how much they're neurologically impaired, and that really should also cue you to the potential of the diagnosis. The second phenotype is the patient with a cervical spinal column fracture causing spinal cord injury, not surprisingly. And the third, finally, patients with acute cervical disc herniation, often younger patients who have higher energy traumas like an MVC. So now that we understand the phenotypes, let's move on to what we should look for on the clinical examination. If you're going to remember two things, it's number one, upper extremity greater than lower extremity weakness, and two, often hand and arm greater than shoulder weakness. The rest of the symptoms can be pretty variable. Some sensory deficits can be present and variable below the level of the injury. Sometimes they're described as cape-like over the upper back and down the posterior upper extremities. But there may also be cases where there's no sensory deficits at all. How should these patients be imaged? Start with a CTC spine, and due to the obvious neurologic deficits, it's very reasonable to include a CT angiogram of the cerebrovasculature. 
An MRI will also be required, but not immediately and really out of the scope of the ED. The findings on CT range from fractures and dislocations, especially among the young people who have a higher mechanism of trauma, to only osteophytes found, or canal stenosis or ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament, particularly among the elderly. Are there any pitfalls in the diagnosis? Well, probably the key pitfall is missing subtle weakness in the patient who has a low energy mechanism and a normal CT. So it really does require you to consider the diagnosis in the patient who's had a hyperextension mechanism, subtle weakness in the hands and arms more than the legs, and some degenerative disc disease on CT. What are the next steps in management? Well, much of this aspect falls outside of what we'll do in the ED, and it's rare for these patients to be hemodynamically compromised due to neurogenic shock. So let's not get into that. But once diagnosed, the patient should remain in C-spine precautions, and I transfer mine into a more comfortable aspen collar, since they'll either require transfer to a spine center or at least have a pretty long wait for an MRI. At some point, these patients will need full spine imaging, but that can really be left to the spine team spine center. The subsequent management is really highly dependent on the stability of the injury. In those who have no identifiable injury on CT, a conservative approach may be taken. There's often no long-term difference in neurologic outcomes in those who undergo conservative versus surgical treatment. But instead, the benefits for surgery include shorter length of stay and faster initial neurologic recovery. If surgery is performed earlier, is better. And what we mean by that is under 24 hours. This broadly applies to all incomplete spinal cord injuries as well. The prognosis is pretty variable, though in some studies, recovery of greater than 90% of the motor score occurs in most patients. Some will have near complete recovery, while others will have substantial deficits. So back to our case. Our patient had a CT scan that did not demonstrate any acute injury, but did show underlying degenerative disc disease. His clinical exam was compatible with central cord syndrome. On exam, his deficits weren't substantial, but they were definitely present. And assuming there's no ongoing cord compression on the MRI, he'll likely have a reasonable recovery. He's going to remain in C-spine precautions, and he was put in an aspen collar for comfort. Spine team is consulted who will arrange for an MRI. We've already imaged the rest of his spine on the PAN scan, so no further CTs are required. He'll be admitted to the ward, and there's a good chance he won't need surgery. So that's central cord syndrome. Here's the quick recap. Number one, it's an incomplete spinal cord injury, meaning there's some sensory or motor function below the level of the injury, and that might only be in the saddle or sacral region, so check those. Number two, it is a clinical diagnosis with upper extremity weakness greater than lower extremity weakness. In a minority of cases, there are some bowel or bladder dysfunction present, but the examination can be subtle, so you must be focused and precise with that. Three, there are three predominant phenotypes, including the elderly patient who has a low energy fall sustaining from a hyperextension mechanism, a high energy trauma that causes hyperextension in a younger patient, or patients simply with some type of fracture dislocation of the C-spine. And finally, number four, CT is the test of choice in the ED, and really you should include a CT angiogram of the carotids as well. That's all for now.